very briefly at the Ecole d'Anthropocène. It's an annual event that we're talking about. It's the most emblematic annual event of the Ecole Urbaine de Lyon. And to a certain extent, it's a way of expressing the way that they feel about their role within society, the way for us to think about the major challenges in society and the way for us to discuss them. In this very unusual year, the school has continued to work ceaselessly. Let me remind you of this, our annual magazine that is due out on the 25th of January. That will be on the first day of the festival, uh, during the festival week. And we've also created what we call an ABC document and a radio. We have the anth Anthropocene radio that will begin on the Wednesday. Of course, we've also thought a great deal about extending the use of digital tools for all of our work. And of course, for the festival week, even though we will never abandon the idea of bringing the audience together, we hope to bring people together. And even if we're not able to bring people together in flesh and blood, um, we will make sure, nevertheless, that we're in a position to exchange with the, our audiences and to disseminate as much information online, of course, but we, we will make sure we disseminate it. So how do we organize this festival? How do we decide upon the themes? Now, as I said, we have a watchdog system that enables us to be in contact with um, all of the different challenges, the subjects that are important during the course of the year. And this festival is organized in the following manner. Of course, we have a wide variety of formats, but we do have a main thread, a main theme for this third year. This is what we call the public classes, the pu public classes that are given by teacher researchers, lecturer researchers from the University of Lyon, virtually one public class a day that begins during the course of the school. We have a wide variety of subjects about French countryside, about law, um, about uh, the possible resources that we have towards different um, uh, solutions for the future, resilience, for example. And we have Miss Michel Lusso, who will also talk about extractivism. And this is one of the subjects that will be born forward during the course of the festival. On the themes, for example, I'm only talking about the key themes here, because I think Serge Duroux will go into more detail in terms of the formats. Of course, we'll be talking about the North-South relationships and the way in which um, Anthropocene is understood in relation to these two hemispheres. It goes without saying that there are many different aspects that we wish to go into detail here. We need to give the South center stage. We also will talk about vulnerability, vulnerabilities in the plural, with very well-known people such as Frédéric Kay or Joyce Armand. They will work on, with us on zoo nose, noses and on all different kinds of aspects. We'll talk about uh, new ideas. This is a theme that is very important for all of the people who work with us. We will talk about uh, proximity, um, uprooting previous situations, bodies we found. We'll talk about what policy for the climate with the tension, the dichotomy that exists between the solutions, uh, the low-tech solutions, and also, of course, the geoengineering solutions, those that um, can be used for emerging policies. We'll have Mark Enza, who will speak, Jean Burke. Of course, we will talk about um, post-colonialism. That is one of the major subjects subjects and has been in particular uh, this year, particularly in the literature system, Guillaume Mont or Christine Chalot. We will also talk about things that seem a bit more complex in terms of subjects, but in fact, we have actors who are very, very clear, materiality of the material with Claire Charbonnier, for example, who produced a remark remarkable book in 2020, the book called Abondance et Liberté, Abundance and Freedom, if I translate loosely. We also have a sociologist and researcher that not many people are aware of in France. We focus on the theme of resilience. You might remember as well that at the beginning of the first lockdown, we all tended to try and find out how our neighbours were doing. When I say our neighbours, I mean our neighbours abroad, abroad, because when we're not able to leave our homes, any neighbours we can talk to digitally become our neighbours. And so we got in touch with friends in Spain, the United States, in Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. And this gave us the idea of putting together a series called Portrait of Spain spaces or space and there will be seven portraits during the course of this week and we will travel to China with a group of architects called O-Office. We'll go to Barcelona 
with Clara Nugula. We'll also go to Venezuela with an architect whose name is Anna Vargas and with whom we're also putting together a program to enhance people's awareness as to the issues regarding public space. And we're working with uh, secondary school students in Bron. We're working with them remotely, working with children in Caracas. We'll also go to New York. Tony Torn, the actor that you can see on Netflix at the moment and in Broadway, if you're fortunate enough to be in New York, he'll take us to his neighborhood, Chelsea, on the Saturday. We'll also go to Kabul with the collective called Art Lords. And we'll go to Lagos as well with a photographer and the photographer has often worked with Nimo Bessi, who is our guest of honor today. And we'll also have a portrait of Leon that will be painted by students. And that would be the result of many of the workshops that we'll put together this week. One is called uh, Watercolors Colors and Mockups with the Leon University. And we'll also work with different organizations from Leon. All of this will be made available in French and also in Spanish or in English. That is something that we want to specify. And this will be the case as soon as we have a speaker who speaks French or English, you will have the opportunity to listen to the presentations uh, in French or in the original language. Thank you, Cédric. Let me now pass the floor over to Emeline Baum. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for being here behind your screens. Thank you for taking time to listen to us. The metropolis of Lyon as an organization and institution changed its territorial governance in the month of July of last year. And we're delighted and very proud to have this opportunity to take part in this event, to relay the information and also to work on innovative practices. We are a very committed stakeholder regarding the approach that you're proposing today. In particular, I would like to provide you with two pieces of information that are absolutely essential for us. First of all, I would like to say to Michel Lusso that absolutely, honestly, this Ecole Urbaine, this urban school, it's the only first programme for training and research focusing on anthro Anthropocene that basically gives us real nuggets, real jewels in the crown, researchers, male and female, who we're going to be able to work with, who can relay all of this information and give us the opportunity to debate on these real societal issues, today's societal issues. That is what is important. And the second point I wanted to raise, and this is for you, Cedric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the formats that you've put together. Thank you for all these approaches that are well and truly part and parcel of what we call the popular university approach. We desperately need approaches such as yours in the light of what we're experiencing at the current time with the pandemic. And also, I used to work in the education sector, and I see that certain ways of educating people in a popular way, that certain ways are disappearing and you're giving them a new life. We need to amplify them. The Lyon Metropolis is going to play a role to help you do so. So thank you very much. Thank you for holding this event and thank you for having known how to adapt it. Thank you very much to you. Michel Lusso, geographer, director of the Urban School of Lyon. Hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome to you. I'd first of all like to say thank you. Thank you for what has just been said, Emmeline Bone, because it's very true. When we originally created this festival week, as Valerie said earlier, we had a first test back in 2018. And this is the third edition, the third true edition uh, of this week. And we set it up wanting to set it up as an open university, bringing together all the forms of knowledge on Anthropocene. We wanted to refer explicitly to popular education and to the fact that it has crumbled away over recent years. Um, what we call popular education in France has suffered a great deal because other economic imperatives have been presented to us as being the only ones that needed to guide public action. And hence, it made what we call popular education much more fragile. A lot of structures disappeared and a lot of visions disappeared because you have to have a vision in, or, in order to be able to support the fantastic project of education for all at all ages at all stages in one's life whatever your condition and I would also say whatever the difficulty or the complexity of the subjects because popular education says that no subject is too difficult to enter into contact with any type of audience and to attempt to enable everybody to understand the challenges in order to achieve knowledge I do apologise, my mask is fall, falling off. Um, it's rather difficult to give a press conference live wearing a mask. 
and online. And it's a great shame because nobody is able to benefit from the extraordinary view that we have, although it's rather misty today, rather foggy, so we can't see very much. Now, we started out with this idea whereby the issue of Anthropocene is placed at the centre, and it's true, ours is the only experimentation and research centre that dedicates its work to the theme of the Anthropocene. We're one of the few people in Europe who focus on it because we formulate the hypothesis of, at the Urban School of Lyon that global change, and I'm saying this quickly, global global change, um, to summarise, is something, something whereby biophysical and planetary systems are forced to change, and this global change is related to global urbanisation around the world. So this is one of the titles that we had for last year. So um, Anthropocene is an urban scene. We, we feed off urbanisation and urban development and hence research work has to be done, new types of training have to be provided because basically all of our certainties um, lose their meaning. What we're talking about here is the fact that we need to recognise that we're living in a habitability crisis on the planet. So we ask ourselves the question, will our planet still be inhabitable for as many people as possible, not in five, six, ten centuries, but in ten years time and maybe even and currently, even today, we have this space that is ravaged by fires every year, and this has been the case um, for years. Look at California. Is our planet still inhabitable? You have towns and cities that face excessive heat, excessive heat that where the temperatures are rising more so than for the last 10 years. Are these towns still inhabitable, particularly for the weaker contingent among us? There are towns and cities where millions of people are deprived of access to water, for example, access to education, access to care, access to basic goods for a wide variety of reasons. Are these towns and cities still inhabitable with the environment being damaged day in, day out? So this question of habitability is not an abstract question. It's a very tangible question and it requires new forms of research because we have to understand what is happening and we have to have a scientific imagination, a creative imagination to be able to come up with solutions, to be able to experiment in such a way that we're going to be able to face up to the challenges and this habitability crisis. So the Urban School of Lyon has being put together with this idea in mind. We need to understand what's going on, but not just for the sake of understanding. We're... Um, academics, so disseminating our knowledge once we've understood the issues is important, but we also need to understand to nourish public debate and to attempt in our own way to take part in reorganising what needs to be reorganised in terms of actions and public policies. This is why we created the Urban School and this is why we set up this week, the aim being to set up a popular university where everybody can connect in order to understand what is happening in the laboratories, what we're talking about, and we're going to do it so that we're going to be able to talk and discuss and then take all the information back home to think about the way in which we can change our actions and of course it's important to remember that everybody is capable of understanding the challenges. Yes, some of the public classes are very demanding. The one for example related to the Collège de France. Uh, these are specialists who come forward to explain the work that they do. We're not talking about standard mediation here. No, we're talking about education, teaching, lecturing that is open to everybody and after the first three years I believe we can safely say that it works, it really does work. And that's why this year, as soon as we've understood that um, the health situation was going to be difficult, um, we thought, nevertheless, we're going to organise this week. Tangibly speaking, we want to be able to invite the general public. We know we won't be able to do so, um, for example, where we normally do at the normal site where we bring together all of the researchers and we're very sad about this. But nevertheless, we decided that we wanted to make sure that we would organise the event even so. We were, we were not going to give up organising this event despite the pandemic. And we felt it was very important to use the best possible digital tools so that we could continue nevertheless to schedule over 100 different activities with a great wealth of formats. We even have thought, and it was last night that we thought about this, well, given the fact that the Prime Minister said that we would all be at home early in the evening, let's be at home and be intelligent. Let's con let's connect early. Let's connect more. So, in other words, every day will enable you to connect to what we're doing at the School of the Anthropocene, and there's plenty to be done. I'm particularly happy that this year 
the main question of extractivism and the depletion of planetary resources is once again placed at the heart of our themes for the week. And it's highly symbolized by the invitation to Nimo Bassi as our guest of honor. We want to illustrate how attached we are to changing the way in which we look, to putting the spotlight on the the eco-feminist and decoloniality alternative approaches to the Anthropocene. The aim is that we all understand that it's not just a question of us talking about global change based on or as of Europe and using standard Western thinking. No, very much on the contrary. We want to look at how other expert knowledge is coming to the fore, how other people are dealing with the crisis and how other solutions and proposals are coming to the fore. And Nino Bassi is an extraordinary guest. I would like to say thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation because you speak from Africa not just to talk about Africa but to talk about the world the world as Africa sees it the world as Africa is able to build and develop it Nimo Bassi is an analyst of a situ of the situation an activist an expert a very engaged person somebody who assumes full responsibilities and this is why it's very important to have him with us because he creates a link a bridge between thinking and discussion and experimentation and public intervention there you are. I don't want to be any more long-winded than I have been. We have a very rich program. And Madam Vice Chairman, I would just like to say that it's very important to be alongside you today because I think we can safely say that since the creation of the urban school, we've pursued with our target, which is to get closer to the metropolis. Ours is the urban school of Lyon. It's not the metro metropolitan school, but it's very important for us to work hand in hand with you for our two forces to come together and for us to move forwards shoulder to shoulder so that we're in a position to educate people through this popular education and impact society. And I know you want us to gradually be able Able to impact and convince the economic stakeholders that they need to change models when it comes to economic development. Not only must they change, but that it is possible, it is possible, and that we mustn't wait before we start to experiment with these new types of action that we're trying to implement. So thank you to everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for all working with us on this event and thank you to all of the team from the urban school who've made this event possible despite the difficult circumstances currently now i think we have a certain amount of time dedicated to exchanges and questions yes we have a first question concerning the global manifesto the anthropocene manifesto that seems to be new for this edition can you tell us what it's about Yes, I'll answer because I was supposed to talk about that and I've completely forgotten to talk about it. So thank you very much to the listener for giving me the opportunity. We decided that on the 29th of January for 24 hours this year, we will organize online. It was scheduled right from the outset online, uh, a manifesto to focus on the Anthropocene. And the idea basically is to use Lyon as a starting point, but then to gradually connect to all those people around the world are uh, thinking about this question of global change and all those people who are able to come forward with proposals. What we're talking about here specifically is proposing to people from all around the world. So it'll run, it'll be up and running for 24 hours. Um, so we'll start at three o'clock in the morning one day and we'll finish at three o'clock in the morning the next day. And every hour we'll have um, small videos that will be able to be deposited, three minute videos. And they will be videos or people, activists, researchers, um, who will be able to take a stand and say, what Anthropocene means for them and they'll be able to talk about a certain number of solutions and every every three hours we will also organize discussion stages where people can, can debate over what's been said. It's a prototype this um, Anthropocene manifesto for this year and we're putting it together thanks to the commitment from Jeremy Cheval from the University of Lyon and the Urban School of Lyon. It's a prototype and if it works and we're sure that it will work, I'd like to stress that we will come back in 2022 with a global Anthropocene manifesto that will be even more ambitious than this one because we'll gradually introduce new formats during the course of this Anthropocene week. So they are, that's a scoop as we say in French, it's an announcement. If you don't mind, says Cédric Dior, just one point I'd like to add on this manifesto, it will also have other aspects that will be inserted performances and I'd like to say hello to Franck Micheletti and his dance company um, that 
has continued to make their artistic proposal evolve. Originally, we wanted to organize a dance for 500 people. Now we have to propose things in the studio. So I would like to congratulate him for all the hard work he's done. And throughout the day of the manifesto, we'll have different inserts, dance inserts that will be proposed to you and we'll give you the opportunity to discover that surprise during the course of the manifesto. Thank you very much. No other questions for the moment. Well, I think in this case, we can pass the floor over to Nimo Obese, who is in Nigeria, who is live with us in Nigeria. So let me remind everybody present, he is our guest of honour for the third edition of the School of Anthropocene event. He's an architect, he's an activist, he's also a novelist and a poet. I'd like to stress the importance of this because I think it's highly important because it's very much part and parcel of his sensitiveness to the human challenges that he focuses on. He received the alternative uh, Nobel Prize in 2010 and today, among other things, he's in charge of the ecological think tank Health of Mother Earth Foundation. And he's going to speak, I believe, on the theme of extractivism and its link with the Anthropocene. Nemo, good morning. Good morning, and thank you so much for having me on this conference this morning. Uh, uh, first of all, let me express my regrets that I can't come to Lyon for the, the sessions that we'll be having. Uh, that, that means I'm going to miss out from a lot of the, the, from the variety of activities and events that we presented during that time. But this is the reality of today's world. And it's much, much uh, better for us to stay safe than to be at the place that we insist on being at. Uh, so th this, this, is, this, is, uh, this makes it easy for me to, to manage the situation. So again, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I, I think this School of Ecology or School of Anthropocene uh, we call our, our sessions in Nigeria School of Ecology uh, uh, challenging people to ask questions on various topics uh, with regard to our environment, regard to the politics behind the activities of extractivism, of food systems, and uh, generally of the, upper, the, the struggle for dignity and respect in our communities, uh, who, which, is, which are ravaged by uh, activities of transnational corporations as well as national corporations. Um, I, I think one of the challenges that we have with the Anthropocene, I, I wouldn't go into the debate about, uh, there's a lot of debates about whether it's a term that we should use, but we look at humans have assumed a certain level of control over Mother Earth, uh, and we don't seem to uh, keep in mind that we don't know everything about Mother Earth, that we don't know about the millions and billions of organisms in the soil beneath our feet, the ones in the air and the ones around us, uh, in the water also. Uh, this kind of uh, superiority in terms of understanding uh, lets, lets humans to formulate principles which we don't also implement. For example, the, the concept of sustainability. Sustainability has been on the card for decades now, and everyone speaks about sustainable development. Everybody wants to do something sustainable. Even the most destructive corporations talk about sustainable profit, and sustainable, they issue sustainability reports, which is really truly amazing that they would have the guts to do that. And, and going back to the basic understanding of sustainability, we find that there are three uh, cycles, three cycles, three aspects, the economy, the environment, and the social. But in everything, most cases, we're seeing the emphasis on the economic aspect. And the economic aspect is about economy of exploitation, economy of destruction, economy, economy of dispossession, economy of violence, as well as displacement. And the environment is just put aside at the corner as something uh, that can be ignored. Another way of looking at sustainability has been to consider people, planet, and profit. And again, people are ignored, the planet is ignored, and profit takes the top uh, level of consideration. Now, this kind of disjointed thinking has driven the very destructive, extractive activities that we've seen, we're seeing around the world, whether in the global north or in the global south. Uh, we, we find it quite in, interesting also that 
countries that have a sense of uh, how bad the situation has been, sometimes are uh, concerned about the immediate territory. For example, France has, uh, I believe the government in France has made uh, the clear position that they're going to, there will be no extraction of fossil fuels in France, but we have French corporations extracting fossil fuels across the world, in other parts of the world. Uh, so the, the sense that I believe Anthropocene has lost track, uh, humans in the driving changes in the world today has gone in the wrong direction, is the fact that we are getting more and more selfish by the day. We're getting more and more restricted to our immediate environment, whereas the planet is one. We don't have an alternative planet. We're not going to move to one asteroid or one planet in the galaxies. We, this, is where, this is our home and we're all on this home and the environmental degradation that we see do not respect political boundaries. They don't respect geographical boundaries. They affect everyone. Actions and conflicts in one part of the world, especially the ones generated by environmental degradation, inevitably affects people elsewhere. Let's go to the Niger Delta where I come from and where I live. Uh, 60 years of oil extraction has totally damaged some part of the Niger Delta to the point that would take generations, many lifetimes to regenerate, to clean up and to restore. Now, this may be seen as something that affects just the Niger Delta, but it's actually a global problem. But because it's in the backyard of somewhere that we cannot see from London or from New York or from Sydney or from or from Paris, then we can comfortably ignore it. But if you look at the living organisms, our relatives, like the fish, uh, they, uh, we, have, we used to have huge, well, we have one of the biggest mangrove forests in the Niger Delta in Africa, and if, in fact in the world, one of the biggest. And this is one of the spawning, spawning grounds for fish. And you have fish migrating from different parts of the world, coming to the Niger Delta to breed and then go back uh, to their territory. We have migratory birds who fly across in uh, regions that are contaminated. Now, when these birds working on and uh, moving based on the memory that years of evolution has given them, when they get to the environment that ought to be conducive and they find that it's been totally destroyed and degraded, then they, they just get totally confused. This is not what the memory told them. They, they've got to a place where they simply uh, find that things are not what they ought to be. And the fish would not go to the internet. They will not go, they will not make a Zoom call to somebody else. And they just get confused. And this is catastrophic and affects humans very deeply. So a little thing that, something that looks little, that looks far away actually affects everyone. It affects everyone. And this is why we believe that we have to rescue ourselves as humans, as human beings from the destructive pathways that humans are driving progress, so-called progress and changes in the environment. We need to, to look at how to repair the situation. We need to look at how to restore the situation and the, the clear way to go is through solidarity. We need to hear each other. And this is why this conversation is important. Uh, this connection between France and Nigeria is important at this moment. And, and also our friends who may be joining from elsewhere is so critical. This is why the school of uh, Anthropocene is extremely important because we can share ideas. We can go back into our memories through art, through poetry, through paintings, through photographs, look at different cities and ask the questions, where did we miss it? Where did we lose it? The kind of economy driven at the moment that, this, that, that discounts the environment and discounts labor and sees the poor laborers in the mines, in the oil fields uh, as being of no consequence because they're not the one bringing the capital. We forget that they're the ones bringing the product that brings the capital. But capitalist businesses look more at the end result than how value is being extracted. And this is one of the saddest things that I've seen personally uh, with the activities of mining companies, extractivist companies, uh, uh, where miners are killed, miners are working in extremely difficult situations just to extract 
some minerals that the corporations need. They extract oil, they extract gas, and then we gas and pollute the communities who live in the oil fields where these things are being extracted. We see this in Canada, we see the United States, we see it everywhere around the world. It's not just something uh, that is restricted to Nigeria or to Ghana or South Africa. It's a global problem. And we need to have a global memory reset that we are one human race, that we really, really have to think together what would happen, what will happen to generations coming after us? Where are they going to live? What would it look like? This is why I, I so much enjoyed the working with Naomi Klein and the team at The Intercept on, on the short documentary, uh, The Years of Repairs, eight minutes documentary, looking back from the future to now look at the pandemic, look at how we overcame the pandemic, and look at how we must repair our relationship. And to me, the critical thing is repairing connection between humans, between ourselves. So physical distancing because of the pandemic is difficult, but we, that must not translate to social distancing. We must stay connected. And I, I believe we, this kind of connectedness is important for us to reclaim, reclaim the pathways that would make the planet livable for generations yet unborn. So the, the, the regeneration is about re reconnecting to ourselves and reconnecting to Mother Earth. Reconnecting to Mother Earth. This is extremely two levels of reconnections before we move too far away from one another. And this is what we have to introduce into to, to, to completely uh, to to completely restructure or reinterpret the Anthropocene. That look, we cannot go on with business as usual. We have to see each other. We have to see one another as necessary to survive. We cannot ignore the microorganisms in the soil. We cannot ignore the birds that fly, that the pollinators, the butterflies. We cannot ignore the labor, laborers in the mines, in the oil field communities. We're all working together to, we should ask ourselves, have we not extracted enough already? Have we not extracted enough already? Do we need to extract more gold? What, for what purpose are we extracting more gold, for example? Do we need to extract more oil when we should be moving away to renewable energy and when the world has already known that we cannot afford to burn, to extract and set on fire or burn all the fossil fuel res reserves that are already uh, detected and known around the world? Why are we still looking for more reserves? It, it does look like the, the drive for capital has completely damaged the system. And we have to find a different way of relationship that is not based on how much you have in the bank, but how much love you have in your heart, how much care you have for one another. It's going to be a care economy. Those who are providing cares, care to the hurting populations, to the older generation, are they being recognized? The farmers who are pushing agroecology, who are working with nature, who are feeding, actually feeding the world, are they being compensated for the work that they are putting all their energy in doing? These are some of the thoughts. I'm looking forward to, to the week we're going to have, especially the session that we are collaborating directly uh, with the urban school uh, on who feeds the planet. That's a pointed question that we need to ask always, who feeds the planet? Certainly it's not industrial agriculture, which feeds animals and feeds machines most of the time and poisons the soil and destroys connection between the farmer and the food they produce and the consumer and where the food comes from. They were really, I'm looking forward to also the conversations on plantation and extractivism, the plantation model that bettered slavery that was strengthened by colonialism and that still persists today, displacing communities and bringing new forms of slavery, including carbon slavery, where people look at trees more as carbon sinks than about vibrant living ecosystems. And of course, we look at, I'm looking forward to having the conversations on green colonialism. This is really, we have to decolonize our thinking and decolonize our environment. Uh, so if you permit me, um, I will conclude my short intervention by saying that the real fight to forestall climate change must be, it's a fight for equality, it's a fight for dignity, a fight to stop destructive extraction. And the question again is who would make this happen? And the answer is it's the people. 
And this conference that is coming shortly is about the people coming together to dream. It's our dream that builds the pathway to the future. Our dream must shift from extractivism. Therefore, we can build a truly uh, system that recognizes the fact that humans are just a, a part of nature and a part and one of the beings on planet Earth. So I, I thank you very much for giving me this moment to intervene and also for inviting me. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank, thank you. Very thank you very much, Nemo. To, to hear you this morning. Thank you. And it's a pity um, not, not, not being able to welcome you in Lyon in person, but it, it will be for next time, I hope. And uh, this time we will use Zoom and um, other platforms in order to, 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 to pursue the, the, the debate with you. It will be a, a great pleasure. Merci, donc Nimo, je crois que c'était vraiment très important d'avoir euh, cette euh, présentation. Thank you, Nimo. I think it was absolutely fabulous. Thank you very much. Very important to have this presentation that gives us a very clear idea of the challenges for the École Urbaine and all the discussions we're be going, going to be having on the theme of the Anthropocene. And as I said, it's very important for us to um, have you as guest of honour. And I hope you all understand now, after what Nimo has just said, why he is so important as our guest of honour. And I think this will give us the opportunity to make a great deal of progress in our discussions and analysis. Now, I grabbed the microphone. It wasn't necessarily my turn. What is supposed to happen now? So let me pass the microphone back over to you, Valerie. Um, maybe there are questions. Maybe there are questions for Nemo. Yes, we, we have a request for information concerning the think tank, the Health of Mother Earth Foundation think tank. Nemo, I know you're head of this foundation. We have a question on this. And then more broadly speaking, can you please explain how you feel about education and sharing knowledge or know-how? How do you see it as an important form of action um, for uh, achieving the targets you've talked about? And how do you see your own participation in a week with the Anthropocene? So over to you. We have two aspects. Thank you, Valerie, and uh, uh, that's, a, that's a very important question about education and sharing of knowledge. But let me speak briefly about Health of Mother Earth Foundation. Health of Mother Earth Foundation, as you already know, is an ecological think tank. Um, we, are, we are concerned about, we're based in Nigeria, but Africa is our concern. And of course, we have the global analysis also. What we, we work on three tracks, hunger politics, asking the question, why are people hungry? Uh, we do know that people are not hungry because there's no food. It's because of other social disconnections and economic issues. Uh, and we're also totally against genetic engineering, both distinction, extinction te te technology and the old school model uh, GMOs. Uh, we, we have another track that is on fossil politics. And in fossil politics, uh, we, we are working on climate change, on uh, forestry and biodiversity. And we're looking at how to um, how the world should actually take action, the alternative actions uh, to to sustain the the try uh, the, the the slide into uh, climate cures. And uh, one of the things that we believe firmly is that we have to leave the oil in the ground, the coal in the hole and tar sands in the land. In other words, you have to stop extracting fossil fuels and move quickly to uh, non-fossil energy sources. And then the last track of our work is called Ikike. Ikike is Ikike, I K I K E, is a Nigerian word found in two Nigerian languages. Nigeria has about five, 500 languages. <laughs> That's a lot because we have a lot to say. And uh, so we, Ikike means, uh, it talks about knowledge, uh, authority, and the right to share, to share knowledge. It is critical. So that, that takes care of everything we do. And we work a lot with building alliances. We, we look at concepts. We look at individuals who have brought up principles and concepts, who have practiced what they, they, they spoke about, uh, uh, especially African heroes like Amika Cabral of Guinea-Bissau, like Franz Fanon, uh, like Walter Rodney, like Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, we, we look at what they stood for, how they ended, like people like Ken Salawiwa, who was executed 25 years ago by the Nigerian state for fighting against shell and oil pollution. So we, 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 we study these figures and we 
use this to challenge younger generations. Our main focus is the communities and the youths. And of course, when I say youths, that includes also the women, uh, clearly and deliberately, because we really want to overturn the mindset. We want to decolonize our thinking and decolonize the environmentalism. We are totally opposed to market environmentalism, and we believe that market forces created the climate problem, for example, and will continue, continue to exacerbate that problem. Uh, so that, in brief, is what HOMEF is all about. Head, head office is in Benin City. We have a small office in Juba, in South Sudan, because the oil degradation in that country is, can be comparable to what is going on in Nigeria. And um, yeah, so that, that's why we belong to networks, of course, the African Food Sovereignty Alliance, uh, All Watch International, uh, Daraja, which is an African collective, uh, Women Against a, a Destructive Extractivism, which is a network of women and other groups fighting against extractivism. And in all these groups, one key thing for us is edu education. We spend a lot of time in the School of, uh, school of Ecology. This year, we plan to have four or five sessions of our School of Ecology. And we are considering this collaboration uh, in this uh, the School of Anthropocene as one of our schools of ecology, the, the first one for 2021. Uh, and then we, we really believe that people have, when people know what the situation is, then they can find the solution. If you cannot explain the problem, you cannot formulate the solution. And so we, we look at the root causes of exploitation, we look at the root causes of, of what is making people poor and what, what is the meaning of poverty and what really is creating the problems we find. So education and sharing of knowledge is extremely important. And uh, we believe that knowledge can be shared on the streets, knowledge can be shared on the farms, in the fields, in the communities, through song, through poetry, through music, through casual conversations. It's not just about the classroom. And knowledge can be shared in different forms and different forms. And this sharing knowledge in this form is often the best way to get people to act because knowledge must lead to action. And that's what we share knowledge that we believe will lead to action. And that's what I hope would happen in this school of Anthropocene that is coming up shortly. Thank you. Any other questions? No, no other questions it would seem. Well, in that case, I would like to thank everybody. I'm under the impression I have a slight echo says the speaker. That was because she had the headset on. So a very big thank you to everybody. Thank you very much, Nemo. Thank you to the Lyon Metropolis, Metropolis because we're at your premises. Um, and that's what's enabled us to organize this press conference. So let me remind those of you present, the week for the Ecole de l'Anthropocene will take place from the 25th to the 29th of January um, at the site where the Ecole Urbaine de Lyon has its home, but it's also a site where we have a partnership with other structures and entities where many different events will take place at the Village Gilet as well, at the top of the Croix Rousse. Um, part of the Hotel 71 will also work with the design school and we'll also be present um, and we'll work with the Comedia Cinema that will help us organize things also at the Terro Square with the Archipel Bookshop that is helping us organize things. Let me remind you that we also have an internet site that the program is online. The internet site is called at the Ecole Urbaine at the Ecole de l'Anthropocène, I'm keeping the text in French, and you can connect to that, um, or at least you can register for any of the 140 sessions that are scheduled and that comprise these seven days. And we are absolutely delighted, whatever, whatever the situation, despite the health situation, we are absolutely delighted to be able to continue, delighted to organize, delighted to be able to enter into discussions together, and delighted to be able to uh, disseminate uh, information and have plenty of discussions with our guests, but also with all of the general public that will be with us. And to round things off, I would just like to say that we have the Lyon metropolis with 1.5 million people living here. It's about three degrees. Nemo Basse has just as much inhabitants, but it's 26 degrees where he is. So thank you very much and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>